All right. This is one of the most famous stories in all of the Bible. Amen. Uh, story of the Red Sea crossing. Uh, you know, so when you think of uh, great stories today, part of what makes a story great, I think you'd agree, is uh, not just its plot, but also its ability to draw you in and give you a role to play in the story. What do I mean? Well, when you watch a movie, right, or when you read a book, uh, we automatically put ourselves into the shoes of the main character and imagine ourselves in that story. And this is why... Uh, this is why different movie genres appeal to different groups of people, right? So it's very hard, for example, for men in general to get excited about watching a romantic movie. Why? Because it's, it's, that's not the role we want to place ourselves in, right? But women love romantic movies. They want to be the main character who gets swept off uh, their feet by the knight in shining armor, right? But in the same way, it's usually hard for uh, women to get excited to watch an action movie. Why? Because that's not the role they care to play. Right? But guys love a good action movie. Right? So, uh, you know, the Marvel movies. Uh, those movies are such a draw to men because the whole time that we're watching the movie, we're imagining ourselves as Captain America. Are we not? No. Not <laughs> uh, I remember watching the movie Speed in high school. Uh, old movie now. But... Uh, you know, Keanu Reeves, and he's a police officer, and he, he rescues a group of people from a, a bus that has a bomb on it. And then, <laughs> and then I remember watching the movie, and uh, after the movie, going downstairs in my basement and lifting weights to try to get my biceps to look like his. <laughs> right? I mean, that, it, it was a success. They pulled me in, and I was the main girl. I wanted to be the main character, right? The greatest stories draw you in and give you a role to play that you really want to play. And I think, you know, this even happened when all of us watched the Super Bowl last week. And so, but there's two different experiences of the Super Bowl. I, I discovered this this week. I kind of knew it, but it got voiced this week. So we're, we're in uh, uh, M Monday. We're, we're, we're at home, and, and I just voiced everybody. I said, you know, the, the day after a Super Bowl is always hard for me because it's hard for me not to envy those guys, right? So I, I put myself in the game and I said, imagine if I was the winner, right? And then Mar <laughs> so Marcy says, that's not what I think at all. Whenever I'm watching a football game, I'm thinking how, how grateful I am that I don't have a job that requires me to get beat up every day, right? <laughs> like totally, she cannot put herself into that sort of scene, but we guys do, right? The greatest stories draw you in and give you a role to play that you really want to play. Well, the story of the Red Sea crossing is one of the greatest stories ever told, but it's great for a different reason. Okay? Most action movies are great, again, because of their ability to draw you in uh, into the role of the main character, and, and the main character is always an image of something you really want to be. But the story of the Red Sea crossing is a great story specifically because it, it does not permit you the role of the main character. Right? Um, modern action movies are popular because they feed our pride that we can rescue ourselves, we can save ourselves, we can defeat our foes, we can overcome our enemies. They, you know, they, they whisper to us, uh, they give us a beefed up view of ourselves, and then they whisper to us, Sean, you can be this in a few years. So get downstairs and work out. Right? But on every other page of the Bible, on every other page of the Bible, the Lord tells us unequivocally, unequivocally, you will never be the hero of this story. God says, I'm the only hero of this story. Sit back and watch and don't even begin to think that you can save yourself or I won't even begin to save you. Okay? So the Red Sea Crossing is one of the greatest stories ever told specifically because, because it does not allow us to be the main character. Okay, so four things I want us to see in this action story of sorts today. I want us to see, number one, why you are not free. That's right. Everybody believes they're free, but I want to yeah. tell you why, uh, why you're not. Secondly, what's keeping you from becoming free? Thirdly, what you need to do to cross the sea to freedom. And then I want to talk about the main character. All right? Why you're not free. So the Israelites... Um, they have an enemy in Pharaoh and the Egyptians that is a, a more formidable enemy than uh, most of us can wrap our minds around. The Israelites, as we said before, were hated 
They were hated and they were feared at the same time. They were hated because they were shepherds, right? Shepherds were kind of that uh, low-class people. But they were feared because they were so numerous. And I think that the the colossal uh, multiplication of the Israelites uh, in in the 430 years that, that they were in Egypt, like... Their multiplication can't be overstated. So in Exodus 12, 37, the number of people who left Egypt heading to the Red Sea is numbered at, it says, 600,000 men on foot besides women and children. So J.A. Moyer says that there could have been as many as 1,300,000 people leaving Egypt in the Exodus. That would be the equivalent of the entire city of Manchester leaving Manchester five times over. Can you imagine the amount of people we're talking about? Okay. So commentators debate the number because the number is just so astronomical as to be, you can't even imagine it, right? But remember this. Remember what the Pharaoh said in chapter 1. He said, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, let's deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous, and if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us and leave the country. So Pharaoh actually believed that it was possible for the Israelites to become more powerful than the Egyptian people. God had blessed the Israelites so remarkably that that the, the, the superpower of the world of the time, Egypt, was actually afraid of them, right? What really drove Pharaoh to say time and time again, no, you cannot leave, was fear. Okay? And we see this fear come out in chapter 14, verse 5, where it says, When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his servants had a change of heart toward the people, and they said, What is this we have done that we've let Israelite go, Israel go from serving us? Now, folks, that, that is not an angry, uh, an angry at our enemies statement, okay? They're not, he's not saying, what have we done? Uh, he's not saying, you know, those evil Israelites, let's go get them because they just cursed us. That's, no. That's a, that's, a, that's a statement of fear. Pharaoh is saying, what have we done? Okay? He's saying, we've just sealed our doom in letting them go. Okay? Now think about that in terms of the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. In chapter 14 here, we're told that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. When we we think of the few instances in the Bible where God actually hardens someone's heart, normally it's them hardening their own hearts. Uh, But when we think of those few instances, uh, we usually think that when when God hardens someone's heart, we think uh, God makes them meaner. Right? Or... Uh, God makes them more calloused. But, um, but that's not what the hardening of Pharaoh's heart looked like here. The hardening of Pharaoh's heart happens because God makes Pharaoh, I want you to hear this, God makes Pharaoh more afraid of what the Israelites could do to him if they leave than of what God could do to him if they don't. Let me say that again. Pharaoh's heart gets hardened because God makes Pharaoh more afraid of what the Israelites could do to him if they leave than of what God could do to him if they don't. Okay? Uh, and that's how God hardens hearts. He hardens hearts through our fears. Okay? And every person in the world today who has not been rescued by the Savior is not free for this reason. How so? Well, in this story, you have two parties who are deathly afraid, right? You have Pharaoh, who is deathly afraid of the Israelites, and then you have the Israelites who are deathly afraid of Pharaoh. And I want you to consider this. Consider the fact that that God, God is actively trying to do in your life every day the exact opposite uh, the exact opposite thing he was working in Pharaoh's heart that day. God was intentionally hardening Pharaoh's heart to make his fear of loss greater than his fear of God. But in your life, in our life, you need to know that God is actively trying to get you to fear God more than you fear loss. Okay? Um, And until God works this in your heart, that your fear of God exceeds your fear of loss, you're not really free. The Bible tells us 
that every, um, every person in the world today is either a slave to the fear of loss or a slave to God, but they are not some third option. Right? So you are either a slave to your fear of loss or your fear of failure or your fear of being seen as incompetent or your fear of never being successful or your fear of being alone the rest of your life or your fear of being seen as weak your fear of losing someone you love your fear of being bankrupt without money your fear of rejection your fear of getting sick your fear of dying you may even live with a very strong fear of looking deep into your own heart because you're afraid you might see something you don't like uh, and you won't know what to do about it. There are some of you that may even uh, fear talking about emotions because you don't know what to do with emotions, right? You're extremely analytical and you know you can't make analytical sense of your emotions and so you avoid them like the plague. And, you know, I, went, I once counseled with a young lady who would almost hyperventilate when we began to talk about emotions. Why? Because emotions didn't fit into her worldview. <laughs> she couldn't make sense of her emotions, and she, she was like she was a genius. Okay? Mentally, she uh, was uh, IQ far greater than mine. But um, what she found, of course, was her emotions kept seeping out. She never cried, except, except uh, at very, uh, uh, very few times. So she was a slave to her emotions. You are either a slave to one of the things I just mentioned, or you are a slave to God, but you are not something in between. And our secular world would like us to believe that, we, that there is some third option. Okay? Um, so, so here's how we know. <laughs> because if we go back to our lesson on taskmasters at chapter 1, right? Um, every taskmaster you could possibly choose to serve in your life will do for you what God did for, for Pharaoh in this particular instance. It will lead you to fear of being without it more than you fear being without God. And in that way, you're a slave. Why? Because you will be without that thing eventually. You will be unsuccessful. Okay? You will die like everybody else. Okay? You will lose someone. You will not work forever. Your money will eventually pass away and be gone to somebody else, okay? So, okay, so, so what might it look like? Okay, let, let's, say, uh, let's say that, that it's true that all of us are a slave to something if it's not God. What might it look like, for example, if you uh, were a slave to your fear of failure? Well, ask yourself this. Uh, why are you such a workaholic? Do you work so hard because the work you do is good and it makes you happy to provide people something they need? Or do you work so hard because your dad told you you would never amount to anything when you grew up? Well, okay. Uh, why do you hop from relationship to relationship? To, is it because you've not found the right person yet? Or is it because you're really afraid of rejection so you reject them before they have opportunity to reject you? Right? Why, why are you so enamored with how your body looks? Is it because you really enjoy wearing nice clothes and putting on makeup and working out and feeling healthy? Or is it because it helps cover up the inner ugliness you feel inside that you don't want others to know about? Okay. Uh, why do you never let anyone know anything personal about you? Is it because you've not found anyone trustworthy enough to share that kind of stuff with? Or is it because you really hate yourself and fear if they knew you, they would hate you too? Okay. So young people, uh, why, why do you fear growing up and living on your own sometimes? Is it simply because that's unfamiliar territory and, and you, know, you just don't feel ready for that yet? Or... Is it because deep down you fear you can't handle life on your own? You fear you can't make it? You, fe you fear becoming the local loser who moves back in with mom and dad. Right? <laughs> Folks, we live in a culture that shouts to us from the mountaintops, uh, freedom. But the truth is, all of us are slaves to something. We are either a slave to some fear or we're a slave to God, but we are not in some in-between place. 
Okay? If you, and, and so if you want to gauge, gauge how enslaved you are, ask yourself this. Are you ready? Ask yourself, what do I do to deal with my stress every day? What do I do to deal with my stress every day? So maybe you browse YouTube at night to shut your mind off. Or maybe you drink. Maybe you, stop, uh, maybe you don't stop doing stuff with your hands until you drop dead at the end of the night. You just you remain constantly busy. Maybe you eat, right? Maybe you watch pornography. Maybe you play video games. Maybe you binge watch Netflix. Maybe you get lost in the fantasy of a book. Maybe you sleep. And then ask yourself, does what I do to deal with the stress of my life actually help me deal with the stress of my life, or does it just help me avoid life for a time? Because that's what the above things do. Am I, avoid, am I dealing, or am I avoiding? And if you conclude that all you are really doing is avoiding life for a time, truth is you are running from that which enslaves you. You are afraid of it, so you're avoiding it. And that's what an addiction is. It's our way of avoiding that which enslaves us, right? The first thing we see from this passage is we see why we are not free. We are not free because something enslaves us. Everyone. Okay? The second thing we see is what's keeping you from becoming free. What's keeping you from becoming free? becoming free. Exodus 14, verse 10, it says, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were, uh, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would be better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. So this is the battle scene. Uh, It's tense. Israel is being forced to face her greatest fear. And the (laughs) the panic that results makes them delusional. They say, didn't we say to you in Egypt, Moses, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? And Moses would have said, no, you nuts, you didn't tell me that at all. You said, get me out of here, right? (laughs) And then they say, It would have been better to serve the Egyptians than die in the desert. What's interesting about this scene is that Pharaoh Pharaoh has already decided what he is going to remain more afraid of. Um, he's, He's already decided that he's going to remain more afraid of what the Israelites could do to him if they leave than of what God could do to him if they don't leave. Pharaoh's made his decision, but now the Israelites must make their decision. Are they going to return to serve their earthly master, or will they step forward to embrace a heavenly one? And a decision like this in our lives uh, always comes at a crisis point. Um, It always comes at a crisis point in our lives. So, um, let me find my place again, sorry. Um, And the crisis point is this. Does the pain that my earthly master has caused me exceed my fear of the future unknown? This is the crisis point. Does my pain, uh, the pain that my, my, my chosen master has caused me, does it exceed my fear of the future unknown? And the crisis points, um, it, it, that's the crisis point they're at here. On the one hand, they're crying out to God for help, right? Verse 10 says... And they cried out to the Lord for help. And on the other hand, they're asking for the comfort of their old slave master again. And the breaking point comes in our lives, folks, when uh, the, the pain of my former slavery exceeds my fear of a new and different future under a new master. And so, um, so the words of Moses... The words of a Moses are so important in in a time like this. So listen to what Moses said to them in verse 13. Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. 
So let's, let's focus on that last sentence. The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. I want you to picture for a moment the masters on both sides of them. If they're, if they're facing the uh, Red Sea, then the master behind them is pursuing them, fighting against them. Okay? In fact, Pharaoh has every intention not of bringing Israel back to Egypt, but of destroying them out in the desert. Pharaoh's fear of the Israelites has likely increased to such a degree that he just wants to eliminate them, right? He's, he's done with these plague games, and he just wants to, wipe, to take out the fear, to take away the fear. But, but here, so uh, the master behind them has come to fight against them. But then he, he, listen to Moses' words again. The Lord will fight for you, not against you. You need only be still. So folks, I don't, I don't care what master you choose for yourself. If you do not choose the God of the Bible as your master, that God, that master will fight against you, not for you. That master is bent on destroying you, not saving you. Right? That master is not concerned with your welfare, but only with its own. Make anything on earth your master, which all of us already have, and it will fight against you. And the breaking point to true freedom in your life uh, will come when you conclude that the pain of serving that master exceeds the fear of serving a new master you don't know much about yet. Okay. So we see why we are not free. We are not free, any of us, because something enslaves us. Secondly, we, need, we see that what's, what's keeping you from becoming free, your pain has not yet exceeded your fear of a new master you don't trust yet. Okay? And then we see what you need to do to cross the seat of freedom. Okay, so let's say, uh, let's say you're hearing this for the first time. Okay? Uh, you acknowledge that you have a master that controls you through fear. Uh, you admit that that master is bringing a lot of pain in your life and seems to be fighting against you, not for you. So what's your next step? Let's, let's say you agree with all that and you have not thought about it before now, what's your next step? Well, look at verse 15. The Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. The, the New American Standard Version, words 15, uh, verse 15 this way, it says, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. Okay. If you are at a crossroads of pain because of your slavery, but you don't fully trust yet that faith in the God of the Bible is the way to go, a way to get out of your slavery, here's what you need to do. Here's your first step. Ready? You need to go forward. Okay. Keep your back to the master that is pursuing you and fighting against you, and go forward one step. That's it. So you, you don't need to know what will happen when you go forward. You don't need to know what's on the other side of the sea. You don't even need to meet your new master yet before you go forward. The only thing you need to do to walk into the freedom God has for you is trust him when he says that he will fight for you. God says, I will fight forward. I, I will fight for you. Now go forward. And moving forward <laughs> will look different for different people. And you've probably seen these different people. Okay? Some people, when they begin to move forward in faith, become fixated at all that God is doing around them. Look at the walls of water. This is awesome. <laughs> Unbelievable. Woo! Jumping for joy, right? And you know, so they're evangelistic fervor. They feel like nothing can hold them down ever again. But other people go forward like this. I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. Right? Get out of the way, the water's going to fall on me. Right? And only as they have journeyed forward quite a distance, these people, do they again, uh, do they begin to really trust their new master. And let me tell you, either way you go forward is fine. All this new master asks is for a mustard seed of belief. Go 
That's all, and you can do that. We all can do that, right? Okay. Let me tell you. Let me tell you one uh, one way that this going forward has played uh, true in my life. So, um, so yet Marcy and I spent ten years in New Jersey uh, from our mid twenties to our mid thirties, and, and about our eighth year. Um, we began to feel the urge to move back home here to New Hampshire to start a, a new church because we had been involved in starting a, a couple of churches down there. The biggest challenge, of course, to, uh, to that decision was how would we find employment for a church planting effort, right? Uh, but Marcy and I were convict, convicted that moving back to New Hampshire was... Uh, it appeared like that's what God was clearly leading us to do, and so we began to make plans and trusted God to surface the means. We just went forward. What, and, and, and it got all kinds of questions about, what are you going to do? I don't know. I'm going forward. Okay. So uh, in the process of making plans, we got invited to participate in a discovery lab through an organization called Kairos Church Planting. Now, uh, Water's Edge, we uh, support Kairos Church Planting through our, our, our monthly tithe. Part of it goes to them. And so, so what's a discovery lab? A discovery lab is a four-day, uh, fairly intense retreat where participants are interviewed by a team of 12 interviewers throughout the course of four days. And the goal of the interview team is to discern with the Holy Spirit if you are ready and equipped to plan a new church. So there's been research done that anybody who starts a new church ought to have uh, 10 competencies to some level of each competency. And so... Uh, Marcy and I were very reluctant to go, and we're very reluctant for two reasons. First of all, we said to ourselves, if they tell us we're not ready, we're going anyway. <laughs> so why go, right? But the second reason we were reluctant was because it cost us $900 to go. So uh, through, through the persuasive legwork of a guy named Scott, uh, we ended up going to the Discovery Lab kicking and screaming, all right? Thankfully, after four days at the lab, the team of 12 told Marcy and I that they believed we were ready to go and plant a church. But that's not the good news. The good news is that, unbeknownst to us, uh, two individuals from the interview team that week were from a congregation in Lubbock, Texas, whose congregation had already uh, set aside $321,000 for a six-year salary for a church planter. They just didn't have a church planter. In less than two weeks after the Discovery Lab, the two individuals gave us a call and invited us to come down to Lubbock to share with their eldership our vision for planning a church in Laconia. And before the end of that weekend, we had a full-time salary. The salary came looking for us. We never even began to look for it. Okay? What's my point? My point is that all we did was go forward in faith that God would provide. We just stepped. We didn't know where we were stepping into. It didn't matter. Go forward. Yes, sir. Okay. If you're at a crossroads of pain right now because of your slavery, but you don't fully trust that faith in the God of the Bible is the way to go, you just need to go forward. One step. That's it. In fact, um, if you're here, this may be a step forward for you. Okay. So we see why we're not free. We're not free because we're all a slave to something. We see what's keeping us from becoming free. We see what you need to do to cross the seat of freedom. You just need to go forward. And then lastly, I want us to see the main character. Okay. Story of the Red Sea, one of the greatest stories. Okay. Uh, but it's great for a different reason. Action stories, imagine you as the hero. Red Sea doesn't allow us that, right? Because the main character is God. God leads him to the Red Sea. God parts the Red Sea. God tells them to go forward. God hardens Pharaoh's heart. God is the one who defeats the Egyptian army. And no one else has any fighting role to play. That's it. Okay. And so here's uh, the point from this, I think, is simple. And that is this. You can't, you can't save yourself. You can't rescue yourself. In fact, if you consider the very real battle you face every day against your slave master, consider it. So whether it be your fear of failure your fear of being alone, your fear of being seen as weak, your fear of being bankrupt without money, your fear of rejection, whatever it be, when you consider that slave master, you know, you know, that if someone told you today, or told you starting today, I want you to never be ruled by that master again, you know how that would end. I, I want you to stop never, I, I want you to stop 
fearing rejection. Okay, I'll do that. No, you can't do that. You know you can't. You can't save yourself from that, right? Truth is, folks, we need someone to fight for us. And although God is the only active agent in this story, he does work through the agency of a mediator, right? And Moses does a pretty good job, we must admit. He doesn't seem to be afraid when the Israelites are afraid. He performs his role and performs it well, but it won't be long before we see Moses as a mediator messing up, right? Mankind needs a mediator in order to serve God. Uh, but what we need is a mediator better than Moses. So Luke, 30, Luke 11, uh, in verse 31, Jesus said uh, the following words, in condemnation of those who did not have ears to hear. He said, he said, the queen of the south will rise up in judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they, re- for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. Jesus said of himself that I am a Solomon, but I'm greater than Solomon. I am a Jonah, but I'm greater than Jonah. The reason Jesus is a Jonah, but is greater than Jonah, is because just as uh, Jonah, just like Jonah, Jesus was cast into the deep for three days. Okay? Just like Jonah, Jesus was cast overboard so that those on the ship might be saved. But he's greater than Jonah because Jesus was cast into the deep for their sins, not for his own. Jesus was cast into the deep innocently while Jonah was cast into the deep guiltily. And the same was true with Moses. When Jesus came to earth, a greater than Moses appeared. Jesus was, uh, was a greater mediator than Moses. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to wash away Israel's enemies. But Jesus stretched out his body over the earth on the cross, and the Lord caused his blood to wash away the enemy of the world's sins. A greater than Moses has arrived. And let me ask you this morning as we prepare to surround communion, are you ready? Are you ready to go forward with Jesus as your mediator today? Are you done with the masters that have fought against you? Are you finished with the pain your masters have inflicted on you? Are you ready to let the hope of a brand new future overcome your fear of the unknown? Are you ready to go one step forward into the freedom God has prepared for you? Are you ready to walk behind Jesus, your mediator, as he parts the waters by his power? Are you ready to follow him wherever he goes, and even if he does not tell you where you are going, you follow anyway? Are you ready to confess that you have cowered behind masters who promised you freedom and gave you fear? Are you ready to give your heart and soul to Jesus Christ for him to do for you what you cannot do for yourself? Are you ready to stop being the main character in your life and finally step aside and let Jesus be the main character in your life? Folks, we we need an army of Christians in Laconia to exalt the name of Jesus and debunk the pathetic pharaohs of our day. And, and Christ's church has a place for you. Okay. Are you, let me ask this, are you pleading, pleading for the souls of your neighbors in Laconia? Are you asking God to rescue specific souls that you know? Do you pray for them by name? Does the, does the throne room of heaven get to hear specific names of specific people you are pleading might find rescue? Are we inviting the Holy Spirit to come and move and break and penetrate the citizens of our fair city so that every person on every block will go forward with Jesus alone? Whose first and last names are you lifting to the throne room of God every day? Who are you inviting to hear this gospel every week? And what's your, what's your next step forward? 